And I absolutely stand behind my claim that silver is going to triple digits one day. It absolutely will. This is my belief. I stand behind it. There isn't anything that I can measure that would show it not going there. Hi, this is Mike Maloney. And for years, I've been saying that silver is destined for triple digits. And I have been called crazy because of that. But I stand behind that. And so in this video, I'm going to compare uh, silver and see what the price would have to be if you adjusted it to keep up with if it went into the same type of bubble that it was in back in 1980 compared to other uh, portions of the economy. I'm going to inflation adjust it. I'm going to compare it to real estate, to stocks, to bonds, and to a bunch of different aggregates of the currency supply. And we're going to see just what silver's price would have to be to strike that same balance that it had when it was in a hyper bubble back in 1980. Now, in 1980, it went through, the, in, in the 70s, it went through this amazing bull market and it was punctuated by a correction in the bull market. I do not consider this, even though it was greater than a 20% uh, drop, I don't consider this a bear market. I consider this a mid-cycle correction in one big bull market. The 70s was the bull market for precious metals. It was the fundamentals and the psychology that was going on, the psyche of the American public and the world. And uh, so uh, in 1980, January of 1980, when gold and silver went into their hyper bubbles, their super spike, um, they were, uh, that, that was not a full-blown currency crisis, a monetary crisis. What that was, was a geopolitical tensions with the, uh, the Iran and with uh, the oil embargo and with big inflation. Those are the things that people were worried about. They weren't worried about uh, U.S. treasuries or the dollar. They weren't worried about the potential collapse of, of a monetary system or a big shift in the monetary system. The next time that gold and silver go into their hyper bubble, their super spikes, it's going to be during some sort of crisis that is, is basically just the backlash from all of the monetary madness that you've seen over the past several years, uh, ever since the crisis of 08. Uh, it's like uh, the, the Federal Reserve, the world's central banks, they've all gone crazy and they just will not allow the free market to work. They won't allow things to balance. So we've begun back in 2001 or two here, we began another bull market, but this is, this is the first half, just like this one, but much larger uh, in magnitude and duration. And then we're in this consolidation. So we're like here somewhere in this cycle. And I'm absolutely convinced that, that, we, that this will play out. And I personally have pretty much bet everything on it. Uh, so, Let's see where it could go. First, let's inflation adjust this. And for that, I'm going to use the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, consu their consumer price inflation calculator. And here I've got $50 in January of 1980 equals $175 today. Now, at the end of this, this video I originally made and then uh, we shelved. Uh, it was made more than a, a, a month ago, so a couple of months ago. So the data that you're going to see at the very end is all as of May. So this is as of July. Um, but I call this the CP lie, not the CPI, because in 1980, you know, along with this date that we're working from, that's when they stopped measuring the same set of goods and services and what the actual price was throughout the decades that they had been following for many, many decades. Uh, and they started doing things like substitution and hedonic adjustment. Uh, substitution, you know, uh, they decided one time that, uh, that choice uh, sirloin steak was too expensive, so people would eat chicken instead. That was under Greenspan. Uh, and then uh, hedonic adjustment is your car now comes with all of these new features in it, standard anti-lock brakes and airbags. And so it's actually, the price actually went down, even though you had to pay more. The car actually got cheaper because of these quality improvements. 
And so uh, uh, what I'm interested in is the real price of things. And for that, there's another uh, thing you can use. If you know who John Williams is or Shadow Government Statistics, it's shadowstats.com. So uh, go there and uh, subscribe to his services for a year, support him. Uh, he's been doing this year after year after year, and he sort of haunts the uh, government's statistics and uh, tries to figure out uh, what smoke and mirrors they're using, and then they, he backs out the smoke and mirrors to try and get a more realistic picture. If you read his public comment on inflation measurement and the change CPI, uh, and you look at the methodology that he's using, he's using the government's own numbers against them. So he's using uh, CPI U R S versus CPI U series, and then uh, you know calculating some of these uh, things. It's very interesting. Uh, now, I believe that the truth lies somewhere in the middle, that the numbers that he comes up with here are exaggerated. If you use uh, $50 in 1980, January 1980 uh, through to today, you've got the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, calculation of $175 per ounce of silver. Uh, and if you, I'm not logged in here, so it's hidden from you unless you're logged in. If you want to keep up on this, you're going to have to subscribe to uh, his services. But in May, uh, the alternate CPI that he uses uh, comes out to uh, $1,226 per ounce. And this is using just a different set of the government's own numbers. It isn't John gone crazy or something like that. So $1,226 per ounce of silver. That's the the inflation adjusted. Now, like I said, the truth lies somewhere between. So where could it be between these? Let's take a look at some other things uh, that uh, have gone up since 1980. This is a median, the median sales price of houses sold in the United States. So this is the Federal Reserve's data, and we're going from 1980 here, and the growth factor on houses, it's up 5.5 times which would give you an adjusted, if silver had kept up, if it was in the same balance today as it was back in 1980 against real estate, it would have to be $275 per ounce. So let's take a look at the S&P, the Dow, and the Wilshire. I'm going to sort of average, if you take all three of those, you come out with growth ranges of 38 times to 40 times from January 1980 to today, and so that <laughs> ends up with a, a, an adjusted silver price if it was in the same balance as it was back then with the stock market. Now, you got to realize by 1980, the stock market had gone sideways for uh, more than a decade, 1966 to 1980, so 14 years of just moving sideways. The stock, stock market had become very undervalued, and that's when silver went into its hyper bubble. And so uh, if it went into that same balance today, you know, we've got the stock market severely overvalued, but uh, the growth in, st in the stock market is 38 to 40 times. So you've got $1,900 to $2,000 per ounce of silver. Now that is way off to the crazy end. I'm not saying it's going to quadruple digits, but anything is possible. I think some of this stuff is hilarious and it's fun just to take a look at. Let's look at bonds. Now bonds uh, on stock charts, I, can't, I can only find uh, the 10 year bond price going back to 2000. Uh, uh, on, they, they don't quote the price on uh, the Fed's website, but this is a bull market here. Uh, it's just that uh, the yield on the bonds is sort of the inverse of the bond price. And so uh, even though this is going down, this represents a bull market. And what you see here is there was a, um, uh, if you go from January of 1980, or if you take the beginning of the bond bull market in uh, 81, uh, September of 81, if you go January of 1980, bonds are up a factor of 7.2 times. Uh, if you use this 81, when the bull market in bonds really began, 
Uh, then you've got 10.2 for an inflation-adjusted silver price of 360 to 510 dollars per ounce. Sorry, I'm laughing, <laughs> but I find this stuff highly entertaining. Um, <clears throat> If you adjust it for uh, GDP, GDP is up a factor of eight times for a silver price of $400 per ounce if it kept up with the growth in GDP. That same balance of the silver price compared to the size of the economy. The monetary base. I decided not to use this. Why? Because uh, the monetary base, most of it, is reserves of depository institutions. So the reserves that the banks have, this portion of the monetary base never leaves the Federal Reserve. This is in the accounts that all of the banks have at the Federal Reserve, and all of the banks have to borrow from each other uh, at the end of every day, uh, because basically banks are broke. Um, and uh, so they have these reserves. You know, what's interesting here, these reserves were fine at uh, $30 million, $15 million, $40 million, $40 million. And then suddenly, uh, $3.8 trillion isn't enough, and we have to keep on. So just shows you the crisis of 2008 never ended. They only papered over it. When we finally get to the end of this, uh, and, and the paper starts coming off, when the wallpaper starts peeling, and you actually see what has happened to the banking industry and the real economy, it's going to be a bloodbath. Gold and silver will be the big beneficiaries. And so we could probably see some of these balances uh, um, uh, change to where um, uh, it's an even bigger hyper bubble against these other asset classes. So uh, I'm not going to use uh, the monetary base, base currency, but when you deduct the reserves from base currency, you end up with currency in circulation. Now this is the currency that actually comes into a coin shop and buys a few ounces of gold or silver at a time. So this is the masses at the very end of the uh, bull market uh, when gold and silver are in the news every day and on the radio and all over the internet and, uh, and uh, um, everybody, every commentator is recommending gold and silver. When it's in that blow off top uh, and uh, everybody that is currently recommending stocks or options or whatever, they're recommending gold and silver and that's it. Uh, then uh, that's when all of the public, who, the Joe Sixpack, who are late to the game, they rush in with this uh, almost two point, almost two point two trillion dollars into coin shops, and they start buying. Now, you know, most of these people have to use. Th this is uh, a lot of what is used for people to get by. People that are on minimum wage when they buy groceries, they're paying with cash, um, and then uh, there's. The M1 currency supply. It's not money stock, it's currency, currency supply. Whoa, 19 trillion. How did that happen? Look at this. This has gone like crazy, exploded here. Now this goes all the way back to 1959, and it used to be a useful tool. This was something that was great data to look at. It was consistent, and uh, uh, what they were measuring in uh, back here was the same as what they were measuring up here, but no longer. This is different. You scroll down to underneath this page, and you see that before May 2020, M1 consisted of this stuff. Uh, and then beginning in May 21, it now consists of this stuff. And if you look at it, you know, it's, it's currency outside of that, currency that is not in the Treasury, the Federal Reserve, the vaults of depository institutions. So that means currency in circulation. It's demand and deposits at, uh, at uh, commercial banks, which means checking accounts, um, uh, excluding uh, depository institutions, so other banks, uh, the U.S. government, foreign banks, so excluding governments and the banking sector, the financial uh, institution. So this is the public's checking accounts. Uh, <clears throat> less cash items that, that is in the reserve float. Uh, and then it also includes three other checkable deposits. That's what OCD stands for, other checkable deposits. 
So anything that you can instantly write a check on and buy an asset with. So, um, uh, you know, and then there's some more uh, uh, stuff about, but beginning in May 2020, M1 consists of, this is the same, currency outside, you know, demand deposits, uh, excluding those, and but then when you get to uh, number three here, other checkable deposits, OCDs, number three here is other liquid deposits consisting of OCDs. So OCDs was, was checkable deposits plus these things. So all of that is just lumped into this now. And savings deposits, including money market uh, deposits. This is very important. It's a huge change in the way they measure things. I've got this going all the way back to 1959, but I want to zoom up on that and show you what they did here. And for that, I'm going to go to weekly data. So we're at almost $19.5 trillion dollars on the M2 currency supply, M1 currency supply, I'm sorry. I'm going to zoom up on this here. I'm gonna take a very small time frame and show you that it was at 4 trillion, you know, zigzagging right around 4 trillion, and then went up to uh, 4.5 trillion, and then 5.11, and then that's at the end of April, and then beginning in May, it's suddenly up at, at basically 16 trillion. And so this is almost an $11 trillion increase. <laughs> and it's not an $11 trillion increase in the M1 money stock. It's an $11, $11 trillion increase in the way they measure the M1 uh, currency supply. I said money stock. I shouldn't have done that. Dan can honk me for that one. It's the M1 currency supply. And here we are at almost $19.5 trillion. Well, let's take, at the, take a look at the M2. M2, so I can't use M1. We can't use the growth of that. They've completely messed up that uh, measurement that they've been reporting since 1959 to make it useless. And this is on purpose. They do stuff like this at the Federal Reserve when they're getting ready to fiddle with something and they want to cover up their tracks. They want to make it really hard for people to measure this stuff. And so here we've got the M2 currency supply, and that's at 20.4. Uh, the M M1 is now at 19.5. So there's only about a 5% difference between these things now. Uh, they have just made M1 completely useless as a tool to track anything. And like I said, this is on purpose. There's going to be something that they're going to do that will show up mostly in uh, that uh, section of the currency supply measurement, unless they start, if it, if it really starts showing up in M2, they'll discontinue this or, or readjust this also. Uh, anyway, uh, when you look at M2, uh, it consists of M1 plus all of these things, and it was plus savings deposits, including money market deposit accounts. Well, now, as we just saw, that's included in M1. So if, if you look down here beginning uh, May, it's M1 plus small, than, uh, they're starting with number two here. So basically, this was already shoved into M1 here. The, this part right here is now inside of this part that they're measuring. So this is not messed up. This is accurate reporting. So we can use M2. And if you use M2, and M2 has grown 13.74 times, giving you a, an adjusted silver price if it was in the same balance against the M2 currency supply of $687 per ounce. So let's go to MZM, which is actually the broadest measure. It's bigger than M2. You know, they discontinued M3 years ago. What? This series will no longer be updated? Uh, it's been discontinued? Oh my gosh, when did they do that? Well, it looks like they did that. The last report was February of 2021. That's close enough. It's only, it's, it's not, you know, that's uh, not that long ago. So let's go ahead and use this anyway that it's been discontinued. But why are they hiding this stuff from us? This, this uh, one here, 
goes back to uh, November 3rd of 1980. And even though they weren't making graphs of it, uh, you'll see that uh, velocity of uh, MZM, they measured, I think, going back to 59. I'll show you that back in them. So they had the data of, they can't measure velocity of MZM without knowing what MZM is. So the Fed has the, had the data, they just weren't showing it. They didn't think it was important to show it to people, I guess. Um, but uh, if we look at this, you know, it has been discontinued. But the, and this doesn't go back to January of 1980. It goes back to November of 1980. So it's actually bigger than this growth factor. And this growth factor, like I said, was as of last May was the last time I calculated this. And it's a growth factor of 25 times, giving you <laughs> a silver price of $1,250 per ounce if silver was in the same balance as this aggregate of the currency supply. Uh, now, remember, gold and silver are money, not just currency, but money. And so if some of this currency starts chasing after that money, and this, the, these are some of the most likely uh, portions to come chasing it. Now, MZM, they call it money of zero matur maturity. I call it currency of zero maturity. So it's cesium, cesium, hmm, that's... Uh, Number 55 on the periodic table, I believe. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but C, uh, CZM uh, is currency of zero maturity, meaning it is withdrawable immediately. It's, it's uh, similar to something that's in a checking account. It's instantly available right now. So uh, what is MZM made up of? Um, it's M2, which we already know is checking accounts, uh, plus uh, money market, f small money market funds uh, and small time deposits, plus institutional money market funds. That is the important part. Who's in, who, what's an institutional money market fund? An institutional money market fund is, uh, th is you know, these are uh, when, you, when a, an institutional investor, a hedge fund, a pension fund, uh, the Goldman Sachs trading desk, uh, uh, any big institutional, not a retail investor, not you and me, any big institutional, uh, f uh, you know, a, a mutual fund, uh, any big fund that has a cash position, it's not cash. It's a bunch of treasuries. It's a money market fund that they are invested when they park their funds that are in what they consider a cash position. They're not invested in a stock or a bond or some other investment class asset. They've moved, moved it to a neutral asset, and that for them is a money market fund, which is cash that pays a little bit of interest. And so this is very important. Why is this important? Because these are huge funds, and if they ever decide to come chasing gold or silver, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's less, this is less small time denomination deposits. Time denomination deposits, you're penalized for early withdrawal. So that currency is much less likely to come chasing gold and silver. This currency is the currency that will come chasing gold and silver. So this is probably the most pertinent measurement of what dollars could come chasing gold and silver should there be a rush toward it. And we were up to $22 trillion back in February. Who knows where this has gone since? Uh, and it is a growth factor of 25 times for a, uh, an inflation-adjusted silver price of $1,250 per ounce. So this is very important. That, um, m those money market funds that we were talking about. Um, well, first... Uh, the, all of this, this the, the smoke screen that they're doing, MZM of money stock discontinued. This one went back to, the, you know, the graph that we're just looking at, 1980 until today, November of 1980. Velocity of MZM, they were publishing, and it went back to 1959, meaning they had this data, but they never, they just didn't show it to you. Uh, and And then... You've got uh, all of these other ones that went back to 59, real MZM and so on. But look at these. Um, 
These were discontinued in 2013. Uh, these are all discontinued. So there isn't a single measurement anymore of MZM that exists that they publish. They've hidden currency of zero maturity, the currency that can instantly uh, change its mind and uh, be invested in this or be invested in that. So uh, in there was uh, money market funds. Now, about half, th these are all of the money market funds. And it's split about 50-50. Between, so there's four and a half trillion dollars here parked on brokerage accounts. It's in people's, uh, you know, half of it is in your uh, trading platform and mine. If you've got any stocks, you've got an account with some brokerage ha house and you can trade that. And if it's in a cash position, it's in this right here. And then you can decide to buy gold and silver with it <laughs> at any given moment and instantly it goes from being parked in these money market funds to that, but it's when the other half of this, the big boys, and they're gonna, you know, they're gonna try and accumulate positions. They don't have, the, the big funds really don't have any gold or silver yet. <laughs> Just wait until they do. But right now, like I said, um, uh, if you use, it, 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 it's $1,250 for MZM, but you know, money market funds, they really didn't start here until the early 70s. So this isn't a fair measurement. This is absurd, but let's do it anyway. Let's say we take the growth of money market funds from 1980 until today. Uh, it's grown by a factor of 75 times, so that's $3,750 per ounce silver. Now, that is crazy. That's not going to happen unless we go into hyperinflation and that will completely change all of these prices and the balances of all of these things. But um, if you take uh, all of these things, let's get down to the bottom line here. Let's look at everything that I've measured here from January 1980 through May of 2021. These are the deflators, the CP lie, the alternate CPI, real estate, stocks, bonds, GDP, currency and circulation, M2, MZM, and money market funds. And the average there, I, I excluded these uh, because of some of the things that they had done to them uh, when it came to uh, the average. I should have uh, left in uh, currency and circulation and M2 and just excluded money market funds. But it's a growth factor of 15 times when you take all of these and average them for a <laughs> per ounce price of 750. Now, when I had included all of these, it was a growth factor of 22 <laughs> times for a price of $1,100 per ounce. Now, I have never claimed that silver is going into the quadruple digits, but you know what? Anything is possible. Uh, and I absolutely stand behind my claim that silver is going to triple digits one day. It absolutely will. This is my belief. I stand behind it. There isn't anything that I can measure that would show it not going there. So I want to thank you very much for watching. If you got anything, please like, subscribe, and share this video, especially subscribing. That makes a big difference in our YouTube results. I want to thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.